Welcome to the Parkinson's Podcast Unfiltered with hosts Heather Kennedy and Kat Hill, brought to you by the Davis Finney Foundation. Heather is originally from New York and was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's in 2011 when she was 40. Kat is originally from a small town in California and was diagnosed in 2015 when she was 48. Heather and Kat have been friends since they met at the World Parkinson Congress in 2019. In each episode, Heather and Kat dive deep into the raw emotions and realities of life with Parkinson's. Well, hello. Hi, I just dropped my ruby earrings down the sink while I was packing my boxes. No. There's no place like home. Oh, no. Moving is chaos. It is upheaval. And for someone like me who's used to a certain amount of chaos, I was looking forward to it until I started doing it. Right? Wow. Yeah, it's it's a huge undertaking, right? You traveled in an airstream and you're still in an airstream with your love, sometimes, right? Sometimes we're we're mm-hmm. slowly transitioning to an to a house. So I I know that feeling though of trying to go touch and go through everything you own. Oh Lord, Marie Kondo, stop it. You're torturing me. And what is this Swedish death cleaning and all these things? I'm more on the hoarder's side. I'm more on the procrastinate to the last day before the move and then shove everything into boxes. Mm, I- interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, I grew up, Heather, you may not know this about me, but I I moved umpteen times as a kid. I don't even, I went to, I think, seven different schools oh. um, and two different high schools. So Adaptable. I moved, you know, I think it's helped me be very resilient. I think it's mm-hmm. partly why I'm such an introvert, haha, extrovert, I mean. <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting as a kid, I was sort of order like I carried my things around. I packed things. I'd want to know where all my boxes were. And I think as a child, I felt like I didn't have a whole story of my life unless I had a box of my things, right? Like my mm-hmm. kindergarten report cards. And my- Oh, that's more like Pandora's box. <laughs> Mine would say, Heather is not paying attention. Heather is looking out the window. Heather is bothering the other children. Interesting. Mine would mm-hmm. say good student, but talks too much. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are on a talk show slash podcast. Yeah. I told Miss Sherwood that I would be doing this someday, but she wasn't very happy to talk to me about that. She told me to pay attention to math first. Yeah. Yeah. So how has it been, friend, going through all your things? Because that's huge. Speaking of Pandora's box, you cannot be sentimental and move to the other coast without a moving truck, which is what I'm doing, without any pod, without anything, taking anything with me, but a suitcase on flight. I even have to leave my cat behind with my daughter. Since it is more her cat, that's okay, but that would be a very tough decision to leave an animal. But creature comforts are things we do get attached to Mm -hmm. when we're going through chronic pain. And, you know, we talked a lot earlier in our the podcast about stories, right? So the stories that are attached to all of our things are really profound. I noticed that, you know, when Ken and I decided to sell everything and go travel, Mm -hmm. it took us a year, Heather, to curate, manage, reduce, get rid of, (laughs) recycle everything we owned. We curated our stuff down to about 20 boxes that could be stored in a friend's garage, essentially. And most of that stuff was memorabilia or pictures that actually could have been scanned had I had a better scanner. But how time consuming would it be to have to scan everything as you're trying to prepare for the move? Right. Are there companies that do these things, right? But. There are, but they cost money and there's also time to like take it in and figure out what you want to keep. So I learned a lot about myself and also about how good it felt to get rid of things and Mm -hmm. to get my hands in the eaves of my home 
and how much time and energy I had spent like taking care of things from bedrooms to bathrooms to children and then to stuff and how perhaps unnecessary so much of this stuff is and how the more I let go, the better I felt. So it almost became kind of addictive. Um, Yeah. The minimalists are onto something. Only have what you can use. They are. And Heather, as it relates to us managing our lives with the challenge of Parkinson's, Mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense if we're not Mm -hmm. spending time tending to, cleaning, fussing with, maintaining, chronicling, and storing stuff. Chronicling. Yes, that is such a good one. As an artist or someone who is a creative person, I have piles and piles that I will be using. Don't touch that pile. Don't touch this pile. I know exactly what I'm using that for. In 1993, I had this idea and there's there are the pieces to prove it. But, you know, it's, it's interesting. And as we age, right, and, and particularly women, um, mm. women tend to live longer than men, right? Mm. And so how this whole trend of the Swedish death cleaning has to do with us while we're still living, curating what is important, what we want to still have with us, but also what we want to leave behind. And since women tend to live longer than men, statistically, Mm -hmm. and are more likely to end up in long-term care facilities, especially women with Parkinson's, it becomes important to think about Mm -hmm. curating carefully what we Mm -hmm. choose to bring to the next stage in our lives. Don't you think? Yeah. I mean, we only have so much bandwidth and so much attention and so much space here Mm -hmm. in our minds, here in our hearts. And here in our immediate environment. And houses are getting smaller. There's that small house movement. I used to be enamored by that until I went to Japan. Oh, hell no. <laughs> but I did want to double back to the statistics. So mm-hmm. around the turn of this, the last century, I can say that now because we're Gen X. So around 2002, the last stat that I read was that 25% of Medicare recipients with Parkinson's are in long-term care facilities. Ooh. That was in 2002. I wonder what it's like now. Palliative care is a huge industry. And so is elder care mm-hmm. and memory care. And speaking of memory care, the part of moving that's hardest for me is very much like the movie Gaslighting. The furniture has moved. Mm-hmm. I keep bumping into everything because I had a routine before. Mm-hmm. It's hard. It's like traveling. You wake up in different places. It's disorienting. Yeah. And it takes energy to reground yourself. So yes. so even what I found when Ken and I were getting rid of things, we kind of started at the periphery and moved in. And mm. we started just living smaller and smaller in our existing space, partly practicing for what life would be like in an Airstream. And getting town, even shrinking the amount of refrigerator that we used so that we had practiced that well. You know, how many forks do we really need? Good point. When to poke you with at night. I know (laughs) he pinches you when you're sleeping. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, you're funny, Heather. Yeah, we we tried not to use things in the Airstream as weapons. Um, it's just right. a general principle that I try yeah, to... Yeah, you can't, you can't throw a plate and smash it when you can't move or when you're in a space that's too small. Yeah. I tried to storm out of the room the other day. My daughter, she, she upset me. I'm like, I'm leaving. And I turned very slowly like a turtle to tell her off mm-hmm. and then had to ask her to get the door for me because that's what's up. But about this disorientation of space, right. I was thinking our bodies, what I wrote, these are my notes for the entire... For this day, there's just three sentences there's, here. There's there's three sentences, folks. For those of you that can't see, and I can't the, read it. Micrographia, micrographia. <laughs> However, here's what's up. The problem with moving is that my body doesn't know where it is in space. Proprioception. Is, yes. Can you tell the, our listeners what proprioception might mean? Because I don't know, and I'm asking for a friend. 
It's the sense of where we are literally physically in space. If you close your eyes, it's the sense that you know where you are, even if your eyes are closed. And we tend to lose that ability in Parkinson's disease. It means we our peripheral vision doesn't work as well. Our touch points of where we are in relation to, to things like... Don't get soap in your eyes in the shower then because you'll fall. Right. Door jams. I would swear they're getting smaller everywhere. They're not. I'm just hitting them more easily. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's, it's a problem. And when you disrupt what you're doing, right? In the case of moving, you're moving things all over your house. Of Mm -hmm. course, it's going to be disorienting. And let's talk about the privilege we have of having enough stuff to worry about. Mm. And some people don't have homes. Right. Lots of people are in care facilities that maybe are not optimal or state run or they don't have family, so they don't have anywhere else to go. Right. And I was talking with someone about the conflicting reports of people of color and the statistics there, you know, for homes and all kinds of things that care for us when we're, when we're elderly. And one thing I did notice is certain cultures take care of their elderly mm-hmm. and certain cultures don't as much. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. in America, we fall into the latter. What is that about? Well, and Heather... So this is interesting that that we're chatting about this, that, you know, we live in a culture that values independence kind of more than it values anything else. And I think both as it relates to stuff. So part of the way we're independent is we buy our own stuff. We get our own house. We prove our value and our success by the things we drive, the things we wear, the Mm -hmm. things our kids do, right? especially those in privilege. Not all cultures have that value. And I think that it's important that I think there's trade-offs to any culture that you live in. And one of our trade-offs is when you are no longer able to be as independent, Mm -hmm. it can be very othering when you have to start letting go of those things. And as you're doing, Heather, is, you know, what do I really need? What What is going to sustain me, bring me joy and essential. be worth it? Right. And what is essential? And what am I willing to pack in a suitcase and haul across the country to start fresh? My goodness, what a huge thing. And I think we just need to be honest that this is not, not all cultures And not even all cultures here in the U.S. have this privilege. Mm -hmm. People of color, of different ethnicities have different traditions, but also different challenges. You know, there are more women in long-term care facilities, but Mm -hmm. there are also Mm -hmm. more marginalized population. And the poor or the less resources we have, the more at risk we are for being alone and not having great support. Right. So we realize that this talking about you know, death cleaning and what I like to say, right sizing can be sort of a privileged discussion. But I think mm-hmm. it's important. And I think, you know, Heather, it's it's a big transition you're having. it, mm-hmm. And a lot of it is not by choice, right? Is this yeah. how you designed your next phase or your next season? Well, here's the part that I wanted to address too. It's not really up to me. My disease or my my, my Parkinson's illness has come to the point where I need more care and care to hire is very expensive. And I was starting to have this thing where my friends felt more responsible and they were trying to step in more and more and they have their own lives. They have their own challenges and they were starting to feel guilty and there were resentments around. And I thought, oh no, we need to separate these two things. I want my friends to have fun with me, for my friends to enjoy me, not come over and ask me if they can do my dishes for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to, when I can't physically do something, I try to hire and I try to find people who also have young families and who might need the extra cash and very generous with them because it makes me feel good because they're helping me so much. But, but, but away from my personal tastes, I recognize I'm lucky to do that, but I can't afford that here in California anymore. So I need to be closer to family and I'm lucky to have some family who cares. Some people don't have families, which is why I think we should have facilities that are made for us by us with adaptive housing. Mm-hmm. Let's buy up all those old buildings that aren't being used downtown and get federal grants. And we're gonna, this is just a dream to redo these things. Mm-hmm. It's a pipe dream. 
Dream, but dreams are important, Heather, and dreams yeah. are sometimes the the catalyst for change and innovation. And I don't know that either neither you or I are, are ready to take that on, but I'm certainly willing to have the conversation of can we look outside the box? Let's just talk about the training that we need to be able to get through this. And think of all the resources we have. Ask friends for specific things. Mm. Say, hey, can you drop off a meal on Wednesday? Yes. Just saying I need some help is yeah. is so broad and a little overwhelming, I think, for people. I would tell mm-hmm. young families this, too, in times after babies are born. Mm-hmm. And I usually encourage people to make lists so that in the moment you don't have to come up with the idea In other words, when somebody asks if they can give you a hand, you can say, oh, yes, please let me grab my list. The list for you, Heather, might look like bringing a meal over or could you haul some boxes for me or could you, you know, take this to Goodwill or drop this off at, you know, the shelter because I want to make a donation. That's a great idea. I was thinking about how we could get back at someone we didn't like. (laughs) <laughs> like like it like an Amelie how Heather. she goes in she's I, I would never do this I would never think of this this was in a movie oh okay. goodness gracious but she goes in she switches out the guy's shoes mm-hmm. she puts salt in his liquor she changes mm-hmm. his toothpaste for Ben Gay or yes. something that's very stiff right. and she and she changes everything she and she has his speed dial which used to be his mom go to the suicide hotline yeah so he thought he was losing his mind of course right right Right. And moving does make you lose your mind. So, you know, that's just a great example of how used to our things that we get. Mm-hmm. And I think now, forgive me if I, I'm probably going to generalize, living in a house with other people, you automatically sort of adapt to the way the other people do things and you're more flexible. In my experience with my friends and also family members who have lived alone, they get in very much in their rhythms. And so mm-hmm. there are kind of the right ways to do things. And it can be very disruptive, like the gentleman in Amelie, except oh, yeah. except he kind of deserved it. Yeah, he was quite <laughs> cruel. I forgot to mention that part. It's always very satisfying in movies when yeah. somebody gets theirs, you know. Exactly. And especially in a fairly... Um, Mm. Oh, I just love that's one of my favorite movies, Heather. Thank you for referring to it. Yeah. Jan Tiersen did such a good job on the soundtrack. It was so beautiful. Mm-hmm. But but let's talk about disastrous moves. Do you have any stories about moves and how they work oh. for you? Oh my gosh. Well, part of for me, what was always really difficult is my mom was really good at letting go of stuff. My mom was not an accumulator of things. Mm. She wasn't um, sentimental in the sense of things didn't matter a lot to her. And I was exactly the opposite as a child. Like I said, I had every every report card, every progress report, every ribbon I ever won, every picture that any friend had ever given to me. And I always had the most boxes. And I felt really out of control when they'd get moved from place to place. And then my mom insisted that I get part with some of them. And that was very disorienting for me. And so yeah. Ken was absolutely shocked when I was able to part with a whole bunch of my my yearbooks. Mm. I parted with my trophies. I got rid of all of my name badges from every job I've ever had. All of my pay stubs. I had my wow. all of my pay stubs from all of my jobs. I mean, question. That's ridiculous. Clarifying question. What did that yeah. represent? to you? What did they represent? So I think as a child, it represented that I had had a continual life. People only knew me in these little chunks, right? Mm -hmm. So in Merced, I was this person. In Los Banos, I was this person. In Mariposa, I was that person. But I needed the whole story. And for me, the story was the stuff. I got rid of all this stuff and I felt so free, but it took me a little while. I didn't do it all in a month, Heather. I did it in 12 months. So, well, letting go requires an amount of faith and intuition. I ain't no Marie Kondo, I'll tell you. I don't fold things. My hands are too shaky to fold. But, you know, it all comes to the same point. Like, don't transfer the ox's load to the cow, as they say in Buddhist Mm. literature, old school. I mean, I don't even know what that means anymore, except for don't take on too much. And what am I really good at? Overestimating my capabilities each day. I wake up in the morning, I have a list of things that I'm going to do that is amazing. By noon, I realize, oh, maybe 17 of these need to be dropped off the list. So when moving, allowing extra space and time 
so you don't injure yourself mm -hmm. and fall and, and perhaps, leave, leave your body. Perhaps curating our things becomes a bit of a um, what synonym or uh, for curating our world a little bit, our lives. Can we be intentional and do less with, do more with less, right? Right, right. And not making them all into symbols. Mm -hmm. Like I have this looking glass ball thing. It reminds me of Wizard of Oz. And I was like, I should take this with me. It's very special. It's one of a kind. Way too heavy. The thing is like 20 pounds. I'll give it to someone who can use it. I know and, some and witches, you know. <laughs> I have rooms for them too. You're... <laughs> But Heather, if it's meaningful, snap a picture of it. Because in our There's digital age, we can put together an album or look back on the photograph and it can evoke sort of that same memory or that same story. Maybe you will paint a picture of it in your world when you get set up. Um, Excellent idea. Maybe we, I did that with the kids' projects. Excellent there idea. Go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We can do that with a lot of things. We can. Speaking of, take a picture of your license and all your your paperwork before you go in case it gets lost. Indeed. Indeed. We did a lot of that digitizing when we went um, in the Airstream because we just mm -hmm. didn't literally have the space. It was, and, and it's really informed how we are moving back into our home life. We mm -hmm. are not buying more forks than we need. And since we aren't trees, the standing people, I bring this angel oak to your attention because it was given to me by someone who is no longer alive. He's very special to me. I'm probably going to bring this picture with me, mm -hmm. but I don't have to bring all 70 of the pictures. The exchange. Right. I'll pick a few. And the thing we can do, we can take pictures out of frames. We can yes. reframe things. We don't reframe. Re I so love it. I you love like that. that. Dr. Alert. <laughs> <laughs> Dig we it. Reframe. We can curate. I love it. Mm -hmm. Pivot and reframe. Well, it's constant for us. Think about it. We always have to adapt, think on our feet. For example, I was doing some twirls just before this, you know, in my new dress. Actually, it was for physical therapy. Ah. She had me turn in a circle as I was walking down an uneven sidewalk. And I kept getting stuck and then I had to go big and stick my leg out and make a noise and swoop around as if I was a ballerina, which mm. changed the dynamic. But I had to be thinking while I'm doing that. So she was having me talk and do math to, you know, multitask or rather dual tasking. Mm -hmm. That's life. Mm -hmm. It gets hard. Nothing ever happens in a vacuum. It's not like, well, I can handle this one thing because that's all there is. No, you forget about the layers of things. Like if you're a parent, you have a relationship, you have a dog. And as we, as our bodies change and our needs change and our movements change, we have to start thinking about our physical worlds more right? Because we have a physical disease and how our houses are set up. It's not just mm -hmm. about forks, right? Right. <laughs> it's sporks. Sporks. <laughs> There's an idea. Multi-use. And occasionally a straw, but a reusable oh, straw. <laughs> but I'm Lori, I mm. know that for Ken and I, we intentionally moved into a one-story house. No mm, stairs. No stairs to get in it no stairs anywhere. We have all of one type of flooring everywhere. Seamless. We are intentional if we place anything on the floors where that's placed because they're trip hazards. You know, I'm not sure I'm going to be like you doing ballerina twists while doing math, Heather. <laughs> math and I are so tight. We're I'm out gonna, here. <laughs> I'm just going to be happy to get down my hallway to the yeah. bathroom on time. Let's and I honest. cue myself with music. So as I'm walking along, I'm saying, you can't tell by the way I walk my, I'm a woman. Like, and, you know, of course I don't get any looks. And I wonder why I get no dates. <laughs> but whatever. They don't even know how much fun they're missing. I, I'm picturing you right now with the ballerina walk the song, and your blue cookie monster coat. Yes. I just got to say. I gave it away. You did. It's somebody mm -hmm. else's turn to have joy in That's that. That's correct. I think I sent it to Kelly. Ooh. Friend. Kelly was my friend that was in the emergency room with me when I was stuck, and you were my friend that was with me during brain surgery. Mm -hmm. Back to brain surgery and all the stuff of moving. 
Mm. How about all the electronics we have to bring now? What do we do with all these electronics on these cords? Label makers? Right. What and just what do we pill do? models. Oh, all this stuff. All this stuff. We have to have because of the illness. Right. Like, for example, I need special shoes now. Mm-hmm. Turns out tying your shoes takes a long time. Mm-hmm. Slipping things on and off. And beds that are specific and sheets that are easier to turn over in. And like we said, straws, we require more stuff just to get by. Mm -hmm. How do we reconcile all of that? How did you pare that down? So I organized, I had a very Mm -hmm. specific spot where I kept my medicines in Mm -hmm. a very orderly fashion. So I knew when I was running low and you know what I've done is I put my medicines in a monthly thing and they're colorful. They're like rainbow colors. And it makes me happy. And I bought a little container for my purse that's really pretty that I carry cinnamon. Are you sure those are medications for Parkinson's? They are. You're awfully happy. They are. Well, darn it. If I'm going to carry this stuff, I want it to be pretty. It's in a pretty purple pouch. Mm -hmm. And that pretty purple pouch reminds me to take my medicines and it makes me not feel so frustrated looking at a brown pill bottle. The the triple P's. The triple P's. I got you. So I think how to bring joy into some of the challenging parts of our world are important. Mm -hmm. Do we want pretty Mm -hmm. purple silk sheets that are easier to slide on or move around in bed? I don't know. But can those two don't have to be mutually exclusive banner snatch cumber bunch and the funky bunch what's the name again bander lou cumberden i don't know that actor cumberlink oh, i can't i forget Eagleberg anyway. cumberding i got it that, that's it that's close <laughs> you're so close you know what i was wondering too hmm. i used to be an entertainer meaning i like to have people over and cook great things okay sort of great things sometimes and I really like to have a place where everybody could land. I can't really do that now. Or if I do have it, I have to have everything sort of set up so that people could find things on their own because I can't get up to get it for them. Um, so I think reducing that stress um, because under underlying mental health conditions can come up like anxiety or you know this OCD we mentioned or depression because if you're not settled in your own pad, you don't have your own possessions sorted. How could anybody else find anything? Mm -hmm. What if I can't move that day? But I I don't want to be alone. I want to make it comfortable for everyone. It takes such a toll on the family and on my kids. My son cried last night because he he really realized that I'm really going to move. And Mm -hmm. it's hard, you know, it's upheaval for everyone. So I try to make things easier by keeping the stuff in order a little bit. And Heather, I don't know if this helps you. I've been trying to give myself permission to be gentle on myself and Mm. say that there are seasons for things. I heard this Mm. from a friend, the term seasons, and I rather like that rather than saying a woman of a certain age, thank you. No, I'm just in a different season is all that there was a season for when we had all of our kids very, very close. And there's a season for when Mm. we are blessed to have them move on and become young adults if we are so lucky. And there's a season for which we need to turn our focus to ourselves. And Parkinson's may have expedited this, but- You left out the season while your friends get divorced. Oh, I did. And they're fighting, you have to pick, oh darn. Yeah, that's not a fun season. I didn't like that season at all. Notice how I just, I fast forward through some of the seasons. Yeah, that's not a fun one. That's part of the digital nomad thing. You can fast forward or choose to dip in or not. Anywho. Right. Yeah. So I just want you to know that I think you are really strong and I think you are brave. And I know it's hard. The change part is hard. And Mm -hmm. I also think you'll grow. And I know that you're resilient. Thank you, because I'm not organized. But wait, I just realized something. Tell it's me. It's Benedict Cumberpatch. That's who it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well played. <laughs> you win. I thought I had yeah, a no. Engelbert. <laughs> Engelbert Bumberdunk and the Funky Munch. <laughs> Munchers. We'll get it right one of these days. Uh, we will. Well, or we're just going to keep showing up and trying, Heather. I think that's right? all we can do. 
Yeah. And to lead into the next part of this, mm. since we do have another part of this two part about moving and transitions, mm-hmm. moving on from friendships, moving on from relationships that no longer mm-hmm. serve one or both parties, mm-hmm. moving on from situations where there's a wall, where there used to be a door. Mm. That's coming up next. That might Curation. be I see. The spicy. No names will be used. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Parkinson's Podcast Unfiltered with Heather Kennedy and Cat Hill. For more information about the Davis Finney Foundation and to learn about educational offerings and community events for people affected by Parkinson's, please visit davisfinneyfoundation.org or dpf.org. This podcast includes information about Parkinson's and insights from our Parkinson's community. It is not intended as a substitute for treatment advice from your own medical providers.